Um, shall I start? Uh, okay. So, um, hello everybody. My name is uh, Nayyar, Abdul Hamid Nayyar. I am speaking from Islamabad. Perhaps so far the only one from Pakistan, but I hope others will also join. I have given this number to uh, many young people. Um, I retired as a physics teacher from Qayyad Azim University, and I'm now living a retired life. An old friend uh, of Sandeep, Sandeep Pandey, a friend as well as a colleague. And we have, um, uh, I, I, I am supposed to be the, uh, the, uh, okay, um, the moderator of this day's program in this moderation, my duty will be to introduce the topic and as well as to um, introduce the speaker, but I will leave the introduction of the speaker to Dr. Sandeep Pandey. The topic today is um, uh, the, the climate change, the, the, in fact, the peace, uh, the, the possibilities of peace between India and Pakistan um, and uh, the issue of uh, uh, it's called Peace in South Asia and Environment is the title of this seminar. And uh, we have today uh, Professor Sagar Dhara who will speak to us and I will uh, ask, I will request uh, Dr. Sandeep Pandey to introduce Professor Sagar Dhara. Please Sandeep. So um, I would like to introduce two people here. Uh, one is, uh, uh, of course, the main speaker for today, Sagar Dhara, and also my young friend Ankit Goel, who has been uh, hosting uh, a series um, uh, of these sessions every alternate Saturday. Um, so uh, Ankit says his internet uh, seems to be down, but but let's see. Um, Ankit can can uh, you know come in whenever he likes, uh, um, in the form of asking questions or or you know any comments. Uh, but let me introduce the main speaker for the day. Uh, uh, so Sagar Dhara is an environmental activist, and uh, uh, in in relation to today's presentation, I think uh, um, the most important uh, uh, <clears throat> thing to say about uh, his uh, is about his initiative at the South Asia level. Uh, he, along with uh, Soumya Datta <clears throat> and some of his friends, including um, trade union leaders, um, has formed a South Asia People's uh, Alliance on Climate Change. Uh, and a meeting was held in Hyderabad, the Indian Hyderabad, because we have a Hyderabad in Pakistan also. So uh, the Deccan Hyderabad in uh, September uh, 2019, and uh, uh, this uh, this uh, forum was formed, and we had participation from Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, unfortunately, because of the deteriorating relationship between the Indian and Pakistani government, Pakistani friends were not able to participate. So it will be a good opportunity today for the Pakistani friends also to know about uh, SAPAC and, and you know, uh, be associated with it. So uh, I would request uh, Sagar Dhara to not only introduce the topic, but also SAPAC. Uh, Sagar uh, is a very committed uh, person. He has taken up uh, cases where um, environmental norms have been violated in projects, um, has pursued them um, at the level of the government, um, has also, uh, you know, pursued them in courts, and has tried to ensure that the environmental law, uh, norms laid down by the government itself, you know, are properly implemented. And, and just this year, during the pandemic crisis, the government of India has made uh, changes in the environment impact assessment, uh, you know, uh, something which is done before a project is initiated. And there was, uh, there were a number of serious dilutions. For example, now a project may, may be started and then 
the project could could apply for environment impact assessment. Uh, so uh, it is very strange that the damage, you know, has already begun, and then you are asking them to to study the damage. Uh, so uh, you know, things are happening in India which are taking us downhill on the road of environmental degradation. And uh, he has been at the forefront protesting this. Uh, he ran a campaign against the the new changes in the environment impact assessment, and um, he. Um, uh, as I mentioned, is coordinating this effort at the at the uh, South uh, Asia level. I remember in 2018 he also went when Professor G D Agarwal was fasting in Haridwar uh, to for the cause of Ganga. Uh, he wanted a law on conservation of Ganga. He went there uh, and he fasted with Professor Agarwal for for some time. So um, he is an academic. He is an activist. And he is also connecting people across South Asia to uh, fight against climate change. So, with these words, I would like to uh, invite uh, Sagar Dhara to make his presentation, and then uh, you know uh, we can ask questions to him. Uh, Professor Shiv Shankar has also joined from uh, Chennai. <clears throat> Formerly used to with, be with the Chennai uh, Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and will now be teaching at IIT Mumbai. As, as a visiting professor and a Ketan, a student from IIM Ahmedabad has joined. So welcome all and uh, Sagar, please uh, take over now. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I guess I gave you a choice, but uh, probably that didn't, uh, you didn't hear it because uh, my connection dipped for, for a short while. Oh. Uh, doesn't matter. Let me uh, put on the screen again and uh, where are we? Okay. Nope, that's not the one. Mm -hmm. We always have this problem. Ah, oh, here we are. Uh, can you see the screen now? Hello. This is a screen on which you have a table uh, with. Uh... Uh, no, 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 no. That's not the one. No, this one says future climate catastrophe is a choice. Can you see that? Oh, it is double whammy for South Asia in warming world. Uh, ORIG. One, one minute. Let me. Double let me just. Let me just you can see a word document. Okay. Let me just try and fix this. Uh, okay. Can yeah. you see now? Yeah. Now, now okay. yes. Now we have the right presentation. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, kind of gave you a choice that I could speak either in uh, English or in Hindi. Uh, but oh, I believe there are some sure. people from sure, South sure. India. I believe there are some people from South India. Yeah, yeah. And if that is the case, then I suppose I should stick to English. Um, yeah, I think your Professor Mayer sir, what will be better? Well, I think I think uh, for the um, I will understand Hindi, but I think uh, it's up to you. You know better. So. Uh, we can just we can go a little faster in English. Uh, I mean, I'm equally comfortable in Hindi. So, so let us let us do it in no English so that Did everybody can understand. Okay. Now this is all. You know, I'm going to go very rapidly through some slides, but I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to uh, sort of spend a, a longer time on certain slides. Now we have global warming, and uh, it's 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 already here. Um, people, you know, often think that it's going to happen maybe 20 years down or 40 years down. It's going to happen somewhere else. <clears throat> this is what's happened to one island in the Sundarbans part of India. You can see that the sea has already come in. So the problem is already here. Now, what is uh, the latest? There is something called the Emissions Gap Report, which UNAP compiles every year and publishes in November. 
uh, of each year. And last year, um, what they said was that we need to come down every year by 7.6% for the next 10 years if we are to remain within the um, 1.5 degrees Celsius warming that uh, we have written into the Paris Agreement. Right now, we are growing at 1.5% plus 1.5%. We need to come down by minus 7.6%. That means we need to degrow. Now, with the U.S. having pulled out, if we, if we move them out, then the rest of the countries will have to actually degrow their carbon emissions by 9.5% per annum, literally an impossible task. Okay. Now, if we were to delay this by five years, uh, the asking rate would go up to 15.4%. Impossible to do. You know, had we started 10 years ago, uh, the asking rate was only 3.3%, a very doable thing. So, you know, it's not, we're not going to stop at 1.5 or even two degrees. The present thinking is that we are going to end up by the end of this century somewhere between three and four degrees. And some of the more recent studies seem to indicate that it could well be even over six degrees Celsius. Now, the minute we talk about a six degrees Celsius average temperature rise throughout the world, you can kiss human society goodbye. <clears throat> now, this is a big table. Uh, all this has been published in a paper. So, you know, I can share the paper with some of you. I only want you to look at, uh, I've extracted out of an even bigger table, the values for South Asian countries out here. Um, you know, actually South Asia is the, one of the two most vulnerable regions uh, in terms of the impacts of climate change. The other being the Sahel region uh, in Africa. Now I will amplify on this a little uh, more, just uh, you know, a couple of slides down. I want you to spend a short while looking at those figures which uh, have been highlighted in red and in green. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, this particular column, which says current carbon dioxide emissions as a percentage of global emissions, you see that India's um, carbon emissions are somewhere around 7% of the total global emissions, whereas Pakistan's uh, are only about 0.6%. Now, there is a term called historic emissions. That means you take uh, all the emissions that that particular region has emitted and you divide it by the current population. India's historic emissions are only 3.2% and Pakistan's uh, is only 0.3%. And yet, both these countries, along with Bangladesh and the other South Asian countries, including Afghanistan, are going to suffer disproportionately. Uh, now, look at the figures in green, and I'm going to compare India and Sri Lanka, because here is the uh, question of choice, and here is an anomaly, which I'm not going to explain in this presentation because we don't have that kind of time, but Sri Lanka uh, ranks 76 in terms of the Human Development Index, whether you like the Human Development Index, which is compiled by uh, UNDP or not, there you are. India is 130 and Pakistan is 150. Okay, look at the per capita consumption of uh, energy. Sri Lanka's is only 0.6, India's is 0.7, and Pakistan's is 0.5. How is it that Sri Lanka, you know, is way uh, above India and Pakistan in terms of its HDI index? Now, long answer short, because they rely much more on biomass than India or Pakistan do, because their cities are not very big. And because um, biomass is ubiquitous. These are the reasons I won't amplify uh, on this at this point in time. Now, how is South Asia going to be hit? It's going to be hit in several ways. And I'm going to highlight some of the more, the most important ways in which uh, countries in South Asia are going to get hit. Now, this is what Bangladesh is going to look like. Uh, uh, 
Dhaka and Kolkata are going to be under the sea and approximately 25% of Bangladesh, 20 to 25% of Bangladesh will be under the sea. Which means that, and these are not my words, these are the words of the uh, Bangladeshi ambassador to India and five crore Bangladeshi climate refugees um, by the year 2050. Whether it's 2050 or 2070 um, is not quite the issue. The issue is that Bangladesh's um, historic emissions is hardly 0.2% of the total global historic emission, which is 2200 GTCO2, whatever that is, okay, gigatons of carbon dioxide, okay, right? just 0.2% and they are going to suffer enormously, you know? So this is what's going to happen to Bangladesh. As far as small thieves goes, it's drowned out completely. More than, I mean, I've been to Bangladesh and, uh, you know, Maldives, probably each country about a half dozen times uh, in the last two decades <clears throat> because of my work with the UN. And uh, it's one of the most beautiful places I've seen, Bangladesh. <clears throat> it's gone. By 2100. Uh, the corals that I saw, you know, below the sea are just absolutely all over the world. And the fish that you see around them, you know, it's gone by 2100. Now, and on the other side, Pakistan and Afghanistan are going to uh, have a very different kind of a problem. On the, uh, in Bangladesh and the Maldives, you see an excess of water. <coughs> on this side, you're going to see an enormous water shortage. <clears throat> Why will that happen? Now, Pakistan has only one major river, which is the Indus. And the Indus really flows through the Karakoram range, which is a much colder, much drier region as compared to uh, the regions from where Ganga, its tributaries, and Brahmaputra and its tributaries come from. And so the Indus is dependent on snow and um, ice melt to the extent of 60% approximately, okay? Whereas um, Ganga and Brahmaputra are dependent only to the extent of uh, between 10 and 20%. So as climate, as warming progresses, what is going to happen is that you're going to have more water in these rivers and in, in, in due course, uh, the water will decrease as the glaciers melt. Now, uh, we have, you know, typically I gave a uh, talk last year the Abhidat uh, Majumdar Memorial Lecture, which was on water conflicts, uh, where I dealt with the uh, Jordan River, the Nile, the um, Tigris, Euphrates, and, and also the Indus River. Now, water conflicts go through three classic phases. One is when there is enough water and everybody is happy and, you know, uh, well, there's not much of a problem. The second is when Water is used uh, to a certain extent and there is a shortage. And so people across the border start fighting. They say, okay, you know, and they use absolutely irreconcilable uh, legal doctrines, like what has happened between the Kaveri and between Tamil Nadu and uh, Karnataka in India. Karnataka says uh, over the Kaveri River water that since the water starts in uh, my area, my uh, territory, all the water is mine. If I give you some water, it is because I'm a good guy. Uh, Tamil Nadu says, you know, when you guys were in the caves thousand years back, we Delta farmers were already using that water. So what are you talking about? We have something called the first water users rights. These are irreconcilable uh, legal doctrines. And then if, you know, they then go to an arbiter. Or to uh, court. As has happened, for example, in the case of this, as happens, for example, in the uh, Indus Water Treaty, they go to the World Bank. And, you know, uh, maybe the court or uh, the, uh, so the World Bank is successful in actually um, saying, okay, you take so much and you take the water from these three rivers and you take the water from the lower three rivers and so on. Now, when that fails, people go to war. And that's exactly what happened. In fact, a large part of the problem between Israel and uh, Syria and Jordan, on the other hand, is the Jordan River itself. I, again, I won't go into the details. It's just for the war. That's it. And uh, many a time when there has been a problem uh, uh, on the Nile River, um, each time Ethiopia or Sudan wanted to uh, build a dam, 
they basically, uh, you know, uh, Egypt says, okay, we'll just bomb your dam. You know, this is what happens. Afghanistan has a very similar problem with the Amudarya, <clears throat> which gives it approximately 50% of its water. That is 70, more than 75% of the water in the Amudarya uh, comes from uh, that, from snow melt and uh, ice. This. So what is going to happen in all likelihood in Pakistan severe water shortages and these water shortages then will cause conflict and they will cause conflict across borders, probably both international as well as within the uh, nation state itself. Now, how we, exactly it is going to pan out um, between, for example, Sindh and uh, Punjab is something that the Pakistanis know much better than, uh, you know, what I would uh, imagine, but it would run a course which would not be very dissimilar to what has happened uh, in Jordan and in in uh, India between between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu and in other places between, for example, Syria and Turkey and um, and Iraq and so on and so forth. Water wars are definitely on the cards, or water conflicts, I would say, are definitely on the cards within the next 20 years. And these are not going to be just within uh, nation state boundaries. These are going to be beyond also. Okay. Now, these are, I'm just going to flash some figures here that Pakistan and Afghanistan are going to be water stressed out by 2040. And these are predictions made <clears throat> by various studies. Uh, so this is something really to, and this is going to impact, in fact, uh, the entire politics of this region or uh, relationships in, within this region. Okay. Uh, Afghanistan is going to have a similar kind of a problem. Uh, so you have on the one hand, Bangladesh and, you know, uh, Maldives having a problem of excess water, and you're going to have a problem of uh, water shortage and water stress, severe water stress, in fact, in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Okay. Now let's come to uh, Sri Lanka and... Uh, and uh, these are two countries which are going to be affected by not just one kind of stressor, but several uh, stresses. And one of the stresses that Sri Lanka is going to face is also going to be uh, one of uh, water stress. And therefore, out of water stress, of course, comes the whole problem of uh, um, risk of food shortages, risk of water shortages, and what that will do. Um, I won't get into the details about that. Now, in the Himalayan region, which uh, basically means it's a territory that is uh, that spans to a certain extent, there are going to be what are called glacial lake outburst floods. Um, now, below each uh, glacier, there is a lake. And that lake increases and the moraine dam that keeps it uh, in place, the lake in place, that bursts. Now, several of these gloves have happened in the recent past. There's an entire paper in which I have listed the recent gloves that have happened. This will happen right across uh, the Himalayan belt. And when gloves happen, they wash out entire villages, farmlands up to 100, 150 kilometers downstream. Uh, several gloves have already happened. And this, these are, this is a scene from you know, uh, a glove that happened in Pakistan some time back. Okay, uh, India, multi-stress situation. Heavy rainfall event in Kerala in 2018. You see the uh, roots of the plantations in the hill areas of Kerala. Now, these are not as deep as the original forest uh, roots are. I actually went there and took these pictures along with a friend. So one of the big problems we are going to face in India, besides a whole lot of other problems, uh, we're going to be uh, facing a lot of problems in India, but I'm going to stress this particular one, is we're going to face a lot of uh, extreme weather event situations in India. And already right from 2005 up to 2020, we've had a series of uh, uh, extreme weather events. The latest one was this year in uh, Hyderabad, in fact, uh, saw severe floods which we haven't seen in the city in a long time, not since 2000, not since 1908, in fact. Okay, now each one of these uh, 
extreme weather events uh, could kill as many as 5,000 people as happened, for example, in the cloudburst uh, that happened in Kedana. The actual count, nobody knows, but the official figure is uh, 5,700. Okay, so heat waves. Uh, in 2015, right across Pakistan and India, there was a massive heat wave, again in 2019. Um, extreme weather events. This is uh, going to, you know, um, uh, really be quite a bothersome thing for, uh, for uh, the subcontinent. What will sea rise do to cities like Bombay? This is what it's going to do. If there is a three to four degree rise, uh, you know, the uh, models uh, indicate that a good part of central Bombay is gone. Okay. So this is one uh, problem that uh, we are going to face and we are going to, we are going to face this climate change and its impacts are, are problems that we are going to face um, in every single South Asian country. Now, here is a second problem which deals with uh, regional air pollution. Now, air pollutants, once they get up into the upper air, upper what is called the upper atmosphere, can travel anything like three, four, five hundred kilometers in a, in a day. Uh, that is why we have this uh, thing called the atmospheric brown cloud, which is a massive cloud, which is particularly uh, thick during the winter period over South Asia. Now, <clears throat> you can see I've, I've done a bit of modeling here. In one day, uh, from the Krishnapattam power plants, which are about 8,000 megawatts right now, if I look at the total capacity, the capacity of Krishnapattam was supposed to go up to 23,000 megawatts, and it's got stalled for various reasons, because renewables have started coming in and things of this sort. In a single day, they have traveled right across from the East Coast to the West Coast, and they've hit the Western Ghats. The problem with the Western Ghats, okay, before I come to the Western Ghats, this is an upper air wind map of South Asia. And as you can see, um, what it indicates is that for eight months in the year, from roughly October to um, about March, April, the winds come from somewhere over Turkey and cross over from uh, over Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and they take a broad U-turn as they follow the Ganga River uh, over northeast India, and they come and uh, come back into India, and uh, uh, they go over South India, and they get halted by something called the Intertropical Convergence Zone, which is somewhere here uh, over the Maldives, somewhere here. It's it's a very deep uh, convection uh, curtain that you have convection current. Uh, it acts like an air curtain out there. So any pollution that it picks up along the way uh, is deposited 500 kilometers down or, you know, 1,000 kilometers down and things of this sort. So you have you have this kind of a thing. Um, and God forbid that you have uh, acidic soils uh, in South Asia in any particular region. Now, the acid gases that are picked up, particularly from power plants, those will be deposited. And you can see out here in the left-hand side graph, these are all, wherever uh, you have these orange and red shaded areas, these are all acidic soils in the Himalayas, in uh, the central part of India, in the Western Ghats, in the Eastern Ghats, uh, in the Andamans, and so on. Now, this deposition will, in the next 10 years or 20 years or so, uh, start making the Western Ghats and the Eastern Ghats ecologically unprotected. And that's where our best forests are. So what is going to happen, for example, uh, in these areas is basically, if you look at the Western Ghats, you have three very major rivers that service the Deccan Plateau, which is the, uh, the, the, the Krishna, the uh, uh, Kaveri, uh, and the Godavari. Now, if the Western Ghats gets into a forest dieback kind of a situation about 10, 15 years down, because it's on low pH lateritic soils and you start putting more acid uh, you know, on it in the form of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide from power plants, then that forest will start depleting and lose its capacity to retain the uh, monsoon precipitation and release it slowly. That's what uh, the Western Ghats does. It retains precipitation and releases it slowly. And these three major rivers and their tributaries, umpteen tributaries, uh, both west flowing and east flowing, 
uh, they have river nor water normally for 10 months of the year and for about two months or three months they are dry. Uh, that will reverse and the four months in which they will have water, uh, they it will not be a steady flow, there will be flash floods. Deccan, uh, the Deccan Plateau uh, of India uh, will be, is already water stressed, it will become further water stressed and that will lead to a lot of conflict. Now, I come to the third point I, I want to make out here. If you look at um, uh, the right-hand side set of numbers that uh, we have out here, uh, fossil fuels give us about 80% of the total global um, commercial energy. But uh, oil is going to get over in about, if I add in shales and so on, in about another 40 to 50 years. Uh, gas, another 50 to 60 years, and coal, definitely in 100 years, okay? None of the other renewables or uh, nuclear energy is in a position to replace fossil fuels. So we are going to get into a situation where basically there, there will be energy shortages. And energy shortages basically mean uh, lots of things. But let me come to another point that I want to make. The entire exchange that you have between agriculture and industry is an unequal exchange. The total amount of energy that, uh, you know, agricultural, that go into agri agricultural produce includes solar energy. And when they exchange for industrial products, what happens is that that solar energy is never counted. So you have a thermodynamic equation which basically equates the energy on both sides and you have an economic equation which leaves out the solar energy and this basically leads to a problem of an unequal exchange of energy which is more or less equivalent to value okay so what happens here is when you do not count solar energy which is what actually we require to become a sustainable society we need to move uh, increasingly towards solar energy and if it is left out what essentially it means, which I highlighted in a talk that I gave yesterday to a, a whole lot of economists, was that current day economics, in fact, is working entirely against uh, a society which needs to very quickly and urgently become sustainable. So economics as, as a subject, in fact, it, it bolsters anthropocentrism. That's what it does. Okay. And uh, anthropocentrism is something that we have actually practiced for the last uh, almost 10,000 years, ever since uh, we moved into primitive agriculture. And if I were to do a very simple calculation, the amount of energy that uh, we have uh, actually used to cut down uh, a third of the forest that we had 8,000 years ago, each year we've used 20,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs, in fact, to do this deforestation. So in short, we've been a very violent society. We've said, okay, all the we can we can steal any amount of energy that we want from nature, okay. And uh, uh, I have not put that slide in. The other problem, of course, is the minute you uh, you uh, take a energy resource and start privatizing it, what happens is that uh, you then um, get into a growth situation. And I will give you an example. If I invest one joule of energy uh, to harvest coal, I will be able to harvest 20 joules of coal. Now, actually, the energy that I've used is only to find that coal and actually dig it out and process it. That's it. Then I have not made the coal myself. It's nature that has made the coal. And yet I put a fence around that uh, you know, uh, entire mine and say every, that whole thing is mine. And out of that 19 joules, if I take two joules this time and try to get more coal, this time around I get 40 joules, 38 is my uh, profit, okay? Now, the minute I privatize energy resources, whether as a state or as a corporation or as an individual, it leads to growth. So both anthropocentrism and privatization of nature, they uh, will push society towards growth, okay? We grew at about 0.1% up to 1800. After 1800, our growth rate was more than 10 times that. It, it's been between, in terms of 
population in terms of uh, uh, energy consumption. Leave aside, you know, GDP. GDP grew at about 2.4 percent after 1800. Okay, all three GDP, population, and uh, energy grew at about 0.1 percent per annum till 1800. But there are limits to growth. And if I take the three sectors, <clears throat> you know, the first sector being where I get my raw materials from, the second where I uh process the raw materials into services and goods and the third where i dump my wastes for over 3000 years inequality because of uh privatization of nature has persisted in the middle sector and there have been revolts out there mostly unsuccessfully but to that extent they changed society over the last 3000 years you've had slave revolts you've had peasant revolts and then finally you've had uh worker revolts and so on and so forth but today the crisis has spread to the other two areas as well that is we are in a situation where we are getting into a resource crunch and we are in a you know which means in the first sector we have problems our resources are limited and we began to realize that ever since the club of rome report was written in uh, 19 was published in 1972 and at the other end in terms of the dumping of wastes we have suddenly realized that it is not just at the local level that there is a problem in terms of absorbing the waste and neutralizing them but the problem is uh, at a global level and this is a problem we can't solve immediately it's simply because once you disrupt a, a biogeochemical cycle like for example the carbon cycle it takes well over 1000 years to fix it and that's where we are that is uh, even if we want to replace for example fossil fuels with uh, you know solar uh, energy and things of this sort and solar energy is not just pv it's also biomass and it's also uh, what is called csp technology uh we don't have copper which will we have copper to last us only for another 40 to 50 years we don't have tellurium we don't have cadmium after 30 years we and if we want to replace it with for example uh, biomass we don't have phosphates after another 60 years or so so even to grow biomass you require forests so our first tipping point which can tip over society is going to be the problem called peak oil which is a surrogate for saying that a lot of non renewable resources energy and non renewable minerals are going to exhaust out before the end of this century the second problem tipping point is a growth in inequality throughout the world and the third is climate change these are tipping points each one of which can overthrow can tip over society so badly that i just wrote after the talk yesterday some british uh, uh, you know professor of economics wrote to me and she uh, said you know uh, things are not looking very bright i said i agree and uh, the problem is that if if uh, society collapses and this collapse is going to be severe because it's going to lead to mass hunger and mass death all over the world any one of these tipping points can do this and when exactly it will kick in if any one of these is is something that we are not sure about we know a little more about when probably climate change will kick in but peak oil is something that we can't predict and i'm i'm a little more afraid of uh, peak oil than i am of climate change because anything that hits you suddenly you don't have time to respond to it i've been dealing with these kind of issues uh for 20 20 30 years or so in industries and otherwise and i'm always worried about sudden gas leaks and explosions or you know things of the sort or earthquakes because you just don't have enough time to respond so what do we do i mean i'm just going to present a very very short answer out here and that short answer is that we have to change our outlook from gain maximization for a few to risk minimization for all and if i were to say risk minimization for all species then economics as we understand it today starts failing because the very center of economics which is theory of value how do you value when you say you know minimization for all risk minimization for all species and yet other species do precisely that they do risk minimization now if we have to make this transition then there are two very broad things we need to do one is all quite obviously reduce our consumption 
because if we do not have alternatives, uh, particularly energy uh, alternatives, then what else? But this is where there is a massive resistance in terms of global thinking. And the other is that if we are to get away from privatization of nature and say that we must replace ownership with usufruct rights, then quite obviously the solution there socially uh, is equity. So there are three central questions, you know, how much energy can we take from nature? How do we distribute that energy? And here I'm using energy as a surrogate for all natural resources. Uh, and the third is where do we get that uh, future energy from? These are three very critical problems that we have, and we really don't have solutions. All I'm going to say is that we need to discard uh, anthropocentrism, and we need to discard privatization of nature. Okay. Uh, now, I'm just going to leave you with one more thought out here, which is, if we are to reduce energy, it doesn't mean that we have to necessarily immediately replace it with renewable energy. Um, renewable energy has its own set of problems, like, for example, intermittence. Uh, so you don't have battery technology, which is good enough today. Uh, you have copper, which is, for example, going to exhaust out very shortly. So what are you going to connect your PV panels with? And so on. But even given the current energy resources, if we are to reduce, there are three devices. One <clears throat> is the center of all consumption is actually cities. If we are to actually uh, reduce, shrink our cities by half, we can, uh, we can actually save 10% of the current energy consumption of 14 gigatons of oil equivalent. The second is uh, if we are to um, get rid of private surface transport and air transport, we can save another 10% roughly out there. And the third is if we are to shift into soft borders, into a paradigm of soft borders, which Europe has done, for example, to that extent, okay? Uh, then that is going to also save you approximately 10% because you get rid of uh, a whole lot of unnecessary, you know, um, arming of the world. And I'm talking at a global level right now. So imagine, you know, a world which moves towards soft borders, it's going to solve a lot of problems. Um, and it's also going to solve a lot of problems. For example, the peculiar wind pattern, uh, wind pattern problems that we have over South Asia. I was asked in Bangladesh by the Bangladesh Meteorological Department as to, you know, given this wind pattern, would they be affected if India and Pakistan start playing footsie? I said, listen, this is a wind map, uh, upper air wind map, uh, which I've got and uh, you come to your own conclusions. So I'm going to end on that note. We have very severe problems in, this, uh, in the world and in South Asia in particular. And I don't see any possibility of resolving these problems until we all come together and decide that we need to solve these problems. No country can do these things. Unfortunately, every country is going to say Every tin pot leader is going to say that I can solve it for you. you. You cannot. You cannot solve these problems except at a global level because the biogeochemical cycles uh, do not, are not confined to national boundaries at all. Uh, and nor is the, for example, the um, energy balance of the earth. It's not confined to one nation. You cannot solve these problems at the national level. Uh, though I fear that uh, a whole lot of politicians are going to say precisely this, that we can solve these problems at the national level, starting with Trump and, you know, all these guys said precisely that, but they can't do it. So if you are to, you know, get all the people of the world together onto one page, then we need to do a lot more talking. In fact, even probably, uh, you know, not just discussing, we will not agree on many things. We need to sort these out in a friendly manner. We need to come together there are only two roads today as I see them. One is we come together onto one page. The other is like the Mayan society or the Indus Valley uh, civilization or the Polynesian civilization, we collapse because of an energy collapse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sagar. Thank you very much. I am sure uh, there will be a heated discussion, um, a large number of questions to you from the, from the participants. Um, uh, I 
I am sorry that uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Shah, is not, I have not seen his name among, among the participants. He wants to uh, say a few things uh, from Pakistani side. And also, there was uh, somebody named um, um, Fazilda, Fazil, Fazilda uh, uh, Nabil, Dr. Fazilda Nabil, who had sent an email saying that she would like to, she has done some work on Indus uh, River uh, problems. And I thought, and she, she said she would like to also speak, and I do not see her name either, unless there are some names which are not visible to me. Uh, let us see if uh, they come in. Uh, before I invite questions and comments from uh, uh, participants, let me sort of supplement some of the things that you have said from a little more microscopic point of view. Uh, uh, it's trying to give some kind of a picture from Pakistani side. The, as you said, in Pakistan, uh, that, that the water shortage, water stress will actually create kind of internal problems within countries. And um, Pakistan would be a kind of a canonical example of that. Uh, it is served by one major river, River Indus. Indus comes in from Tibet and passes through Indian territory and then Northern and Kashmir, and then comes down to Pakistan all the way from North most to the Arabian Sea. And uh, <clears throat> this is the only source, well, there are tributaries which uh, bring water into this river also, but in major part, this is the only river which provides water for irrigation and Pakistan's agriculture depends very heavily on this river. Uh, if something happens to this river, then Pakistan will starve. There are no other ways of uh, getting uh, water for Pakistani agriculture. So uh, this is kind of a um, life and death uh, problem for Pakistan. And not only there, there is a, there's a problem that uh, most of the arable land is uh, in uh, Punjab and in Sin. Sin is a lower riparian and uh, Punjab is upper. And Punjab, uh, there's a large amount of uh, <clears throat> Cultiv extra cultivated, uh, getting, getting land for cultivation, new land for cultivation, and therefore a lot of water gets consumed over there. Um, in, the, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in, in the in the sense that river Indus is sort of completely drying, uh, by the, uh, drying down by the time it reaches uh, the, 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 uh, the sea. So at the end, you know, the sea water has uh, come up the river, and that has spoiled a large number of things. My friend, M.A. Shah, works with fisher folks, and fisher folks have a large problem. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of, um, uh, there were lots of fisher folks uh, living on Indus River and catching fish and supplying supply fish and uh, mangrove tea, uh, uh, wood to cities. They have disappeared. They just had to migrate. They had to go away because they just could, the river was not there for them all the time. And uh, it is available in some uh, some seasons, but not in all the seasons. Um, and uh, it has hurt, uh, uh, you know, a large amount of land in lower sin near the uh, sea, and it has also uh, hurt the uh, mangroves over there therefore the fisheries and therefore the problem over there. That is one very big problem, internal problem that is causing a lot of, uh, you know, conflicts within, between, between the provinces in Pakistan. Um, Pakistan has not uh, put all things together to solve this problem. I think this is soluble. Plus, Pakistan is also trying to build a number of dams on those rivers to generate electricity. And building of dams means that there is a larger control of the flow of water, which actually is resented by the lower riparian sin. So there are all of these things, uh, sources of conflict present in uh, uh, Pakistan at this time. The other conflict is with India, because uh, India is also building a number of uh, 
dams and uh, on, on rivers that come to Pakistan from Kashmir. And uh, mm, uh, this is something which is particularly on Janab and Jhelum. And they are, uh, and Pakistan has, has a serious problem. Um, I think so far the, the Indians have not violated in the Indus Water Treaty. Uh, at least this is what the, uh, what the uh, conclusion of uh, uh, the World Bank uh, is, which is, which is actually our Indus Water Treaty, Treaty Organization. So the uh, thing is that, but Pakistan's fear is that the dams in the making or under plans are going to create this kind of problem. And plus the kind of, uh, you know, the, the flow, uh, if the flow is not uh, regulated according to the nature of the crop, then that is going to create a lot of problems. So these are certainly associated problems over there. I thought I should, I should just uh, uh, bring them up to supplement whatever you are saying. I think um, Pakistan would be a big example of conflicts on the basis of water. Um, the question that I had in mind was that, you know, um, has, uh, for, have forest, for, uh, forest fires and their consequences been studied in South Asia? Are, they, are there many? Have they uh, led to any serious problems uh, in environmental uh, pollution? Um, this, is, this is something that uh, I have not seen and I would like to just, just the, 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 to, to, to raise this question, and um, um, and I am also now inviting other people to ask questions. How would they do that? Would they be a, uh, would people raise their hands and I will see and I will invite them or what? What will happen? Yeah, uh, Professor Nayar. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't have much time actually. Uh, okay. It be supposed to be for one hour, but we can go on for 10, 15 uh, minutes. Okay. Uh, but I would like uh, Sagar Bhai to concentrate on uh, just India and Pakistan. I mean, he, he talked in general about South Asia and the world. But uh, the, the topic uh, that we wanted him to speak on was how a friendship between India and Pakistan uh, has environmental consequences. So if he could, you know, slightly speak on that. Um, the major problem that, uh, okay, let me start with a small story. Um, I was in Islamabad in the capacity of being a technical advisor to the UN uh, several years back. And interestingly, after the official discussions, uh, the Pakistani officials, of course, got very friendly and uh, they showed me a document which uh, leave aside the um, computations that they did, but the basic logic and conclusions were quite right. Uh, the document basically said that that even if 5% uh, of the Indus uh, water under the Indus Water Treaty uh, is uh, not given to Pakistan or somehow Pakistan doesn't get it for whatever reasons, then the malnutrition of the under 10 year olds in Pakistan uh, is going to jump by about 15 to 17 percent. Whatever the figures be as to whether it be 15 or 17 or 10 or percent in terms of malnutrition, the logic is quite correct. So what is Pakistan really uh, worried about? It is essentially trying to do risk minimization. So what is the solution for this? Uh, I'm not an, I don't work in the field of water very much. I mean, somehow water conflict uh, interested me on one occasion. So I did a little bit of work on that. But on the Kaveri and um, uh, river problem, uh, after discussing with many uh, friends, both in Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka, it appears to me that the solution really is that the farmers on both sides or the water users on both sides should get together and decide that who should get what fraction and that no water user should be left out or no potential water user should be left out. It has to be done much more on a people-to-people -people basis on the actual users than on the government. The minute you leave this just to the government, then there are going to be problems. And that is a lesson that uh, we need to carry um, uh, to the problem that exists on the Indus water uh, uh, 
uh, treaty itself. So far, I agree that as far as I have understood, the Indus Water Treaty has not been violated um, so far. But that it could be violated is the fear that Pakistan has. Okay, And uh, there was, in fact, a mention, a, a glancing mention of this by some uh, you know, politicians in India some time back. This was reported in the press. Okay, So uh, the fears in Pakistan are not unfounded, and therefore, uh, people need to get into the act. You know, I, That's going to be a very tough ask. I'd say that uh, this now will have to be not left only to governments, but it should also, the people on both sides who are actually water users should also be party to this whole thing because they're stakeholders as well. And it's not just people from Punjab uh, on uh, either side of the uh, international border, but also from other parts like Sindh or, you know, um, Haryana and so on, Rajasthan, they, they must get into the thing, or Kashmir for that matter, they must get into it. This must become an issue because uh, uh, I uh, fear that 40 years down we are going to have oil wars, but much before that we are probably going to end up seeing water conflicts within the next 20 years, not just in South Asia, but in many other parts of the world, particularly in Africa, we are going to see this problem uh, cropping up. And if we are to try and provide solutions uh, for the world for this particular problem, then uh, let's take a lead here in South Asia and see what we can do. Both India, Bangladesh, India, uh, Pakistan, uh, and so on. Now, uh, India is a very peculiar country because literally every other South Asian country except Afghanistan have some kind of a you know border with India. So, Indian people, in fact, uh, it is uh, in their interest to talk to people of other countries, like in Pakistan and Bangladesh, and uh, try to understand some of these problems, uh, both resource problems as well as environmental problems. Because, uh, for example, air pollution from India is entering uh, neighboring countries, which particularly those which are east of India. Okay, And uh, this has been discussed at the UN level uh, from time to time. It has, it has not yet caused problems, but it will cause. Because forest dieback uh, in neighboring countries, particularly in the Sundar ones, has a low pH soils. So these are problems that we need to now start understanding and solving. Great, thank you very much. And any any other question, um, Sandeep? How do we invite questions? <coughs> yeah, people can <coughs> just uh, you know uh, they can raise their hand or they can just unmute themselves and ask. May I ask? Uh, may I say something? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. Professor Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think that part of the response to climate catastrophe is demilitarization. Militaries consume enormous amounts of energy. The U.S. military is like an insane consumer of of fuel. So, I mean, if people are ever going to come to the point where they understand that some serious work has to be done to contain uh, the disaster that is unfolding, it will have to include an awareness that you just can't fight wars anymore because you just can't afford to run a military. Great, great point. Wonderful point. Yes. Um, any other questions? Yeah, so, in fact, that was my question to, to Sagar Dhara. What are the implications of, uh, you know, uh, keeping the military and, and making weapons and especially, you know, nuclear weapons? Uh, does it have a significant uh, consequence on, on carbon emission? Of course, that's what I said. Yeah. That if you start moving towards soft borders, you're going to be able to save 10% of your total energy consumption as on date. Okay. You know, it has other implications. There are all kinds of implications because with the, you know, when I talked about water shortages in uh, Pakistan and, you know, God, for whatever reason, if there are problems between Sindh and uh, Punjab and you have a balkanization process underway in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, then uh, a problem which uh, the US and India have uh, feared for a long time, at least as the press reports 
that is what will happen to the nukes in pakistan you know in, under whose control will they be these are all issues which uh, are direct almost direct consequences of uh, some of the environmental problems that we have ankit goya you had written a question would you like to ask this some, uh, this your question uh, yeah um, am i audible i think my internet yes you are down. you are audible yes okay uh, so uh, i want to ask one question that uh, sagar ji has uh, uh, like demonstrated one uh, slide in which he showed the relationship between gdp and energy uh, so my question is like if uh, like there are some international provisions framed by united nations framework of climate change Uh, like kyoto protocol which talks about carbon credits then there was copenhagen agreement which which lead to establish establishment of green climate fund in which the uh, the rich countries they are supposed to uh, give 100 billion dollars to developing countries by 2020 so are these provisions enough to sustain the development in developing countries if uh, if they want to like hold back on their carbon emissions so uh, this is my question well the short answer uh, i have written and published uh, stuff on this so it's easier for me to send you uh, these things you know uh, publications i'll just give you a short answer for the time being because sandeep said we should have time we can never catch up the developing countries can never catch up with the developed countries uh, why uh, even if you see we have only about another the 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide that we can release globally uh before we are pretty certain that we will hit uh, a 2 degree celsius global uh, warming right now if this is called carbon space now if this entire 200 gigatons is given to uh, the developing countries you will not even come anywhere close to the kind of development levels that uh, the developed countries have reached why see i talked about uh, the concept of historic emissions the per capita historic emissions of developed countries is 1200 tons per person the per capita uh, historic emissions of developing countries is only 85 in fact for the uh, for south asia it's something of the order of about 35 to 40 tons per person so even if you were to give the remaining 500 tons gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide to the developing countries you will at best get up to approximately maybe 150 tons where are they they are at 1200 tons maybe 200 tons at most you can you cannot get that not through this route at all okay and so the answers for this lie elsewhere they lie in fact in a completely borderless world where people in fact historically people have always moved to where energy is and uh, it is it's only in the last 2 300 years that energy is coming to where people are the whole uh, migration pattern of human society for the last 70000 years is in fact in search of energy without going any further and that is what we should do all over again let's allow people to free uh, flow to where energy is there are going to be problems but those have to be sorted out because the larger problems have to be solved the smaller uh, problems will have to be somehow uh, we'll have to adjust to you know the cultural issues and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, issues of that sort we'll have to sort them out if we don't do this we are in for a global collapse this is uh, uh, my take on the thing because renewables cannot replace fossil fuels as on date that is what our uh, studies not just mine but several of us are now looking into this quite seriously for the last 10 years this is what it indicates that unless we learn to cooperate the the world as a whole and in particular in south asia we are not going to survive there is there only two roads either we learn to cooperate and become a far saner society a, a more equal society a more sustainable society or the other route is we are doomed mm-hmm. increasingly i see more people writing on this subject now <coughs> Mm. Yeah. So cooperation is a must. Mm. There is another another question from uh, Ketan. Um, great, no, okay, no, there was only a comment. Sorry, and it just disappeared from the screen. Uh, any other question? No, 
if Ketan's question is there, Ketan, would you like to ask? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, do you think uh, that international pressure to demilitarize the region will catch up soon? Like, you know, what are the dynamics in this area? Purely based on, you know, climate change cause. Is any progress being made here? Not that I know. In fact, uh, I am not an expert in this subject, but my, you know, reading as a lay person uh, on the subject of uh, uh, peace and so on, is that in fact, uh, uh, a lot of countries and corporations are more interested in selling arms today. And that's exactly what's happening. That conflict is something that uh, is, is generated. And in fact, I had opportunity to discuss with some bureaucrats and so on as to why did the Agra summit fail, uh, you know, between Pakistan and India. I don't know how far this is true, but I was told by several uh, people that it's the corporates that in fact got into the way of the whole Kashmir agreement, that they didn't want peace between India and Pakistan, because then uh, they would not be able to sell arms to both sides as, as much as what they're doing right now. There was a, there is a... I mean... Hmm, yes, sorry, go on. No, I mean, uh, basically from uh, all that I have understood of the Agra summit was that uh, the agreement was almost done uh, on the issue of Kashmir. And, uh, you know, without again getting into the details of all that, but apparently the corporates got into the way and didn't allow it to happen. Whose who's yeah, opinion is this? Whose opinion is this? I, I have not read that. I've, I've, I know that um, the, the, there was a strong lobby within the, within the, within the BJP, which, uh, you know, stopped it. But I, I, this is this is a point that I had not read before. Yeah, well, this is something that I gleaned from, uh, you know, several bureaucrats and uh, people in uh, in the field of politics, active politics, and so on. It's not from one source. It's from the, several the, uh, sources. But this no, I, I asked this question because because the because the corporate sector of India. Uh, uh, stands to gain a lot with India-Pakistan friendship and no, greater trade between India and Pakistan. It's, it's not the co Indian corporates, it's the arms dealers. Arm dealers, I see. Okay. International okay. arms dealers, International arm were, dealers. It, were not in favor of the uh, Agra agreement. Okay. Even if we just uh, don't limit ourselves to the Agra uh, negotiations, I mean, it is a fact that uh, United States... Uh, uh, sells arms to both India and Pakistan and in fact uh, has also been conducting joint military exercises. So I think uh, Ketan, uh, um, you know, um, contrary to what you are suggesting, uh, uh, there may be some international pressure to bring down carbon emissions, but I think uh, otherwise the developed countries are interested in encouraging the conflict because that is when they can sell their arms. Uh, so, uh, so that is something uh, you know, um, which the which the developing countries have to worry about. I think uh, uh, you know between India and Pakistan, they should they should uh, uh, deliberate on this. That you know uh, why the same countries are selling arms to them, are encouraging uh, you know military exercises and, and conflict and all that. In this context, I remember that um, you know. Um, uh, uh, I, I don't know how much it is true, but I think I think it is true because this was uh, told to me by Professor, uh, uh, I mean Dr. Surendra Gardekar, uh, who is a who is a uh, anti-nuclear activist. Uh, so um, he told me that uh, uh, immediately after no, this is the time when China was going to conduct the nuclear weapon uh, test in the in the 60s, and the United States offered India. Uh, to test the bomb on its soil. So they said, we will give you the bomb, you test it, because we don't want a communist third world country to be the first uh, developing country to have a nuclear weapon. And, and, and that time, apparently, Nehru turned down the offer. He said, no, thank you, we don't want this bomb. Uh, it's a different matter that, you know, uh, his, his uh, uh, grandson, Rajiv Gandhi, uh, took the decision to uh, to make a bomb for India, which was ultimately tested by Atal Bihari Vajpayee. 
and and very soon after india tested pakistan also tested and so far india and pakistan have not signed uh, either the ctpt agreement comprehensive test ban treaty or the npt nuclear uh, non proliferation treaty uh, so it is very unfortunate but there was a time uh, essentially i want to say that uh, nehru probably did not want to escalate the tension um, and uh, you know, there have been you know pakistani leaders also like imran khan and and shah mahmood qureshi uh, took a wonderful initiative of opening up the kartarpur sahib corridor um you know but uh, we have not come around to a point where leadership on both side agrees at the same time to have peace and that is very unfortunate yeah so my comment was basically because these are western countries actually pressurize india and you know developing countries that you should reduce your carbon emission and then on the other hand this is one area where we have significant amount of uh, energy utilization and yeah, you know yeah. there they are trying to sell their arms so that's quite uh, yeah. contradictory yeah, yeah. R- russia has been selling arms to india has been setting up nuclear power plant in india and now is also conducting uh, joint military exercises with pakistan uh, you know um, so far china has not helped india militarily but uh, it it does help pakistan in a significant way so all these uh, big countries you know have interest in 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 um, selling their arms and promoting conflict um so i think uh, sagar dhara is right that the that the what is called the military industrial complex you know uh, the international military indian, indian uh, military industrial complex and israel is also part of the game now they don't want uh, peace between india and pakistan mm-hmm. yes correct mm-hmm. any other comment or question i think we are way past our time uh, yeah. should we mansi mansi from yes. ahmedabad wants to ask a question okay uh, thank you uh, thank you people for the presentation i have bad throat but i will quickly uh, put my point um especially uh, to the questions of ankit and ketan because i am guessing that they are younger generation and i'm always inclined what they are thinking uh should we not ask our government uh, about the peace budget of the country either side you know uh, about the environment budget of the country and uh, as because some of us are also uh, um, uh, academicians we should encourage uh, the younger generation to look through uh the environment budget peace budget vis-a-vis the uh, army budget of the country you know the military budget of the country things come very clear i mean let us not go f- uh, first to international arena but also look inside you know a country which spends uh, so much on uh, military either countries in fact most of the countries uh, where is our ministry for peace how many initiatives we take every year for peace process visa we how many initiatives we take for conflict i mean i completely agree with uh, sagar that uh, there is no other way than a route to cooperation uh, either through either it happens through corporation or um, academia or art and culture i don't see military is really going to budge any side for cooperation the whole idea of military has a flaw because they want people of i any society to live in fear so i think it's it's also the onus of the younger generation to ask their right for future through asking simple question not questioning the military but asking where are the peace budget where are the environment budget and do a comparative analysis over last 50 years 20 years i'm saying this because they have to ask right questions because if we keep opposing we are not heading anywhere against the strong leaders we can ask simple questions very annoying questions and i think uh, they they can uh, matter and especially with the younger generation i agree with you can i respond very quickly to this sure yes, sir yes please please hey uh, what i fear is that uh, the process that we are seeing in the last 5 or 7 years is in fact going to deepen all over the world which is a right foot spring um and uh, in order to counter it unfortunately given covid and all these kinds of situations the space for um democratic minded people peace loving people has shrunk 
Yes. And this is not just in the subcontinent, but also generally all over the world. Now, there are a few initiatives that we have taken, and I will put them on the table. And uh, we have deliberately not advertised it uh, very widely yet. Uh, for example, on the on the EIA question, which unfortunately the Pakistani uh, you know participants will probably lose out out here. We have already filed a PIL in the Supreme Court. We are in the process of preparing a couple more. Uh, on the EIA question, we are, we are questioning the entire environmental clearance process, not just the draft EIA notification. Uh, what is under preparation is also something else, which I wrote in a paper which was published a few months back, which is that um, basically food and water, health, and uh, environment should become fundamental rights in India. Okay, yeah. Yeah. the real problem in defining a what what is an environmental a fundamental right, but that these should also become fundamental duties of the government, which is not a category in the uh, union, uh, in the Indian constitution, but it can be made a category. Okay. Okay. And allocate 10% of this uh, union budget, as well as every state government's budget for each one of these things, which means 30% of your budget is tied down uh, uh, into this. Now, it's not that if we go to court that we're going to win the case or something, but you go to court uh, basically to start making noise about yes. these issues. Why do I say we need to make noise? Because with a deepening climate um, crisis issue, risk minimization must be given much more priority than it has been. It, it doesn't even get 2% of the budget today in India, for that matter. Okay. So um, we need to up the entire budget. And it is through these means that we talk about, uh, along with this, that if you have to increase the budget for this, then you have to decrease the budget elsewhere. What is that budget which we feel is not required or which can be decreased? Precisely this. And this is this will work only if you know talking to each other like this. The pressure has to come from people. The government is not going to do it. None of these governments are really going to do this kind of thing. So I completely agree with you. But the process has to be broadened because, uh, like I said, with the rightward swing that we have, if you don't agree with your government today, you're anti-nationalist. And sedition charges will be slapped on you. Yep. Uh, Sandeep, what is your word now? Sorry, uh, we can close, but uh, Ketan has just reminded us that uh, when India chose France uh, over UK to buy the Rafale jet, uh, the, the UK government uh, uh, stopped the development aid to India. Uh, you know, so th there's, a, there's a connection there, you know. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah. the sale of arms is also tied to the development aid mm -hmm. that they give to the developing yeah. country. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, thank yeah. you, for reminding us. Not important for India because India, the development aid that India receives, or you know, the role that plays uh, in whatever so-called development, is is quite small. Oh. So it really and you know, it really doesn't matter to India very much. See, but it may, but yeah. uh, somebody used the term sustainable development a while back. Uh, I just like to make a short statement. That's an oxymoron. Either have sustainability or have development. You can't have. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah. I think that is a good point to end the debate with. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, like on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank Professor Sagar Dara for this wonderful talk. I actually have uh, many pages of his talk written on my notes, and I'm going to go through them. This is my first ever lesson on uh, the environmental problems in South Asia. Thank you very much. I, I, are you going to make your transparencies, your transparencies available to participants? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, that would be wonderful because we couldn't note down the numbers. Uh, so so that would be great. Um, I think um, our friends will, who, have, who have organized this yeah. will uh, distribute this by email or by on this, uh, you know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you. thank you very much for, part, part, for participating in this meeting. Thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye.